everybody have a chance to take a breath here and we'll get going again so we're now going to launch into a very controversial part in part two of the one hope of original Christianity the kingdom was at hand it's a very controversial part of this subject however I think we can travel in safety because we have the expectations of the Old Testament to guide us. The controversy centers around this. Matthew says, Jesus announced the kingdom of heaven was at hand, while Mark notes, he did the same for the kingdom of God, and Luke says, he did the same for the kingdom of God. Is there a difference between these terms, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God? Some say there is, and some say not. <laughs> well, I think that over the course of my classes that we have seen, the Bible is a precise document. Those who maintain that it contains contradictions have only read far enough to corroborate their incorrect opinion. If they studied further and compared scripture with scripture and word with word, I believe they would see the nuances of the details which would eliminate the apparent contradictions and paint the precise picture of the events that were involved. We have done this with the names of God, for instance, in the one God of original Christianity, each name emphasized a different aspect of our Heavenly Father. Therefore, the phrases Kingdom of Heaven and Kingdom of God cannot mean exactly the same thing because there are no other terms like that that mean exactly the same thing. There are terms that are close, but they do mean slightly different things. That's why they're used. So, like the rest of biblical terms that are, are close, those emphasize different aspects. But there's a great clue here, because the phrase kingdom of heaven is used in no other gospel except Matthew. But Matthew also uses the phrase kingdom of God. So, we should be able to look to Matthew to discover the nuances of meaning between these two phrases. Because, you know, that's what we do with other words that are synonyms. You look for a, a place that they're used together, and then you can see the differences between them. So, that's what we're going to do. We know from the Old Testament that God's kingdom is over all. We covered that in my One God of Original Christianity class. God's reign as king and his kingdom is over all and it is forever. Psalm 10, 16, first half of the verse said, The Lord is king forever and ever. Verse, uh, Psalm 47, verse 7, for God is the king of all the earth, singing praises with understanding. Psalm 95, 3. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Psalm 146, 10. The Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. E.W. Bullinger, in Appendix 114 of his Companion Bible claimed that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God were different. He explained that Jesus, who spoke Aramaic, originally spoke the words, the kingdom of heaven, when he preached. But when his statements were later translated into Greek, the translators at that point, when converting from one language to another, 
and that's when idioms and other figures of speech in the original language are of necessity dealt with. They could exercise options of rendering the phrase literally or as a figure of speech. The phrase originally stated as the kingdom of heaven was the figure of speech metonymy, M-E-T-O-N-Y-M-Y, that heaven was put for God himself. And so they decided to literally translate it into Greek as the kingdom of God. But Bollinger says that, quote, Matthew was divinely guided to retain the figure of speech, literally heaven, so as to be in keeping with the special character, design, and scope of his gospel. Well, what was that? He portrayed Jesus as king. All right. So, Marcus as the servant, Lucas as the son of man. So, Bullinger in his Appendix 114 contrasts the two phrases, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God, in eight ways. So, the kingdom of heaven has the Messiah for its king. It's from heaven and under the heavens upon earth. It is limited in scope. It's political in sphere. It is Jewish and exclusive in its character. It is national in its aspect. It is the special subject of the Old Testament prophecy. It is dispensational in its duration. On the other hand, he says that the kingdom of God has God as its ruler. It is in heaven over the earth. It is unlimited in its scope. It is moral and spiritual in its sphere. It is inclusive in his its character. It is universal in its aspect. It is, in its wider aspect, the subject of New Testament revelation and will be eternal in its duration. At this point, you know, he said that Bullinger's observation that the kingdom of heaven was a, quote, special subject of Old Testament prophecy, that really rings true for us because we followed that theme through the Old Testament. It is from this that we can infer the rest of the traits and not look at it tainted by modern theology because we're considering it exactly like the believers of that day did. Can you see that? Can you see that when John and Jesus announced that electric statement, the kingdom of heaven is at hand? What else? But what we've seen from the Old Testament, could the believers think that it meant? See, it definitely had messianic overtones. As such, it indicated the beginning of the end times that the Jews were anticipating. To many, the coming Messiah was expected to be a military ruler who would reassert Jewish independence and dominance over the world. This would entail confronting the Romans. One of the apostles even had been a zealot, a group from a group which promoted the overthrow of the Roman occupation. Imagine the conversations that they had with Matthew, who was a publican, a tax collector. He was on the opposite side of the political spectrum. This idea about a military messiah was so pervasive, it even affected the rest of the apostles, who still, even after being with Jesus throughout his ministry, wondered, just before the ascension, if he would then restore the kingdom to Israel. Remember that? 
So Jesus' use of this phrase, kingdom of heaven, would have been very intriguing and inciting. He was boldly calling for repentance because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Looking back on these events, we Christians understand that these anticipated end times were separated into two parts, the suffering of the Messiah and his glory. We're going to see in a future session that the administration of the church era, the age of grace, is in between. This age of grace is the time period in which we now live, in which salvation is by grace, according to the book of Romans, it's not dependent on our works, according to the law, and that was hidden from the Old Testament prophets. It was the subject of the great mystery, which was revealed to the Apostle Paul. And as 1 Corinthians 2, 7, and 8 indicates, had Satan known it, he would not have had Jesus crucified. But to the Jews living during that time, not knowing this mystery, and only knowing the Old Testament prophecies of the future, the implications of Jesus' use of this phrase would have catalyzed great hope and excitement. As I noted earlier, E.W. Bullinger, which I think is the greatest modern scholar in the subject of biblical figures of speech, he recognized a great truth regarding the phrase, Kingdom of Heaven, and that was that Jesus, who spoke Aramaic, originally spoke the words Kingdom of Heaven, but when his statements were later translated into Greek, the translators at that point, when converting from one language to another, which is the time that you deal with idioms, could exercise the option of rendering the phrase literally or as a figure of speech. And that's the translator's prerogative. And I understand that very well, because I presided over committees which were proofreading the translation of my books into other languages. And believe me, converting the idioms and the figures of speech are the most difficult task of any translation. I would use some colloquialism in my English, and the translators would be scratching their heads. How are we going to say that? See, um, <laughs> the phrase originally stated as the kingdom of heaven, like I said, was the figure of speech metonymy. Heaven was put for God. Furthermore, there is an additional figure there, because the word heaven is always plural in that phrase. So it literally is the kingdom of the heavens, plural. The second figure is heterosis, which is a common semitism, where something is put in the plural to emphasize its greatness. So I can see how the Greek translators would have stopped cold and had to wrestle with the best way to convert that, those two figures. How are they going to translate it? see um, and so they decided kingdom of God was a good literal option but then remember Bullinger said that Matthew was divinely guided to retain the figure to keep with his spectral, pe special character of his gospel well I would amend what Bullinger said in light of the information that we know from Eusebius and Papias, which is that Matthew originally wrote his gospel in Hebrew. So I'm going to say that the translator of Matthew into Greek was divinely guided to retain that figure. Okay? Um, Matthew's translator into Greek grasped the nuance between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God when the other translators that translated the other gospels did not. Now, of course, we don't have any proof for this. But 
Yeah, if, if Orthodox theologians can put forth their views with no proof and expect them to be taken as fact, I at least can put forth my theories once in a while. <laughs> I think Matthew's translator did this because the translation was done early while the apostles were still in Jerusalem. You see, this theory of Bollinger regarding Matthew's Greek translation fits with my theory regarding why we have the Synoptic Gospels. Three of the Gospels were obviously written by Semitic writers, for there are many Semitisms in them, including what clearly were the Greek translators' comments, like in Matthew, Mark, and John. Consequently, this points to a Semitic original that was translated into Greek. The church father Eusebius mentioned that Matthew wrote his gospel in Hebrew. Papias, who lived around the turn of the first century, wrote, Matthew compiled the writings in the Hebrew language, and everyone translated them as well as he could. So, what's that say to you? It says the Greek translator had some difficulty. Okay? There is some debate as to whether this quote-unquote Hebrew was what we now term as Hebrew or whether it was Aramaic. But regardless of that, it was Semitic. And I believe that the Bible was translated in other languages early as well because the teachings of Jesus were so wonderful and powerful and healing that they touched all people from all nations and therefore is axiomatic there was great hunger to utilize them to evangelize and this would especially have been the case after the great mystery was made known that the word was going out to the Gentiles this also makes Christianity stand out from other religions in that its scripture was not locked away in only one or two original languages. But early on, with the apostles' sanction, it was translated in other tongues. Soon the scriptures of the Christian church were in Latin, Coptic, Georgian, Gothic, Ethiopic, Slavonic, Armenian, Arabic, and Nubian. As Christianity spread outward from the Middle East, some of these variations contained corroborations of very early textual evidence because they were translated from very early manuscripts. And then, of course, I've also taught that Paul set the standard by doing a dual original of First Thessalonians. And Luke, a companion of Paul and disciple of Paul, I think certainly would have followed that example with the Gospel of Luke. But there is a difference with Luke because instead of a Semitic original, Luke and Acts contain evidence of a Greek original because of the Greek medical terms that Luke, who was a physician, used. So, um, but the portions that record what Jesus said in Luke were in Semitic original, Aramaic, because Jesus spoke Aramaic. He did not speak Greek. So there still was translation going on, even in Luke's material. All right? Luke makes reference to Aramaic in Acts chapter 1, verse 19, in which he clearly indicates that his tongue, Luke's tongue, was not the same as the Jews. Acts 1.19, it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper, or in their beautiful tongue, Akadelma, that is to say, the field of blood. So, it appears that the three Gospels, which were written by Semitic 
believers were translated into Greek by different translators because the style of the Greek differs between Matthew, Mark, and John. The Gospel of Mark is much simpler, but the Greek of John is flowing and beautiful. The first three Gospels have been called the Synoptic Gospels because they're so similar. Several hypotheses have arisen about their origin. One of them is that the Gospel of Mark came first and Matthew and Luke borrowed material from it for their Gospels. They think that this is so because Mark is shorter and simpler. So they postulated that the other Gospel writers sought to fill in more details. I don't believe that. I think that the more likely time that Mark wrote was later in his career when he was assisting Peter in Babylon because he would not have had much credibility earlier because he had left the field with Paul on his itineraries and he was the source of the argument and ultimate split up between Paul and Barnabas. So John Mark didn't have a very good reputation early on so therefore I don't think that anything that he would have written would have been accepted. All right. Another hypothesis involves a missing Aramaic document that scholars have dubbed Document Q. This was an assumed document of a grouping of the sayings of Jesus in Aramaic that his followers put together. So some scholars think that Matthew, Mark, and Luke drew their material from that source. It may be partially true, especially for Luke. It ignores the fact that most of the gospel writers were eyewitnesses, and even more, that they were highly trained by Jesus, and that they all were filled with the Spirit. Now, Luke in his introduction states that written records of the sayings of Jesus did exist and that the believers brought them to the apostles for evaluation. However, Luke states that what gave his information its certainty was that it was out of them from above. So the revelation Luke received trumped any discrepancies that could have been in his source material. Since the phrase kingdom of heaven is used in no other gospel except Matthew. And Matthew also contains kingdom of God. It is the best place to find the slight nuances and meanings between those two phrases. The phrase kingdom of heaven occurs 33 times in Matthew. There also are several variations. Gospel of the kingdom four times children of the kingdom twice, his kingdom, referring to Jesus's, twice. The phrase kingdom of God occurs four times in Matthew with two more variations, thy kingdom, referring to God, and once as the father's kingdom, twice that as that. So let's test what Bollinger discovered by looking at the first announcement about the kingdom of heaven. This one is spoken by John the Baptist. Matthew 3, verse 2 and 3, where John the Baptist was saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's at hand. It's near. It's implying that it hasn't started yet, but it's eminent. It's around the corner. It's something to be prepared for. So it was still in the future when John spoke of it. Well then, logically, since the kingdom of heaven had a starting point, it could not be the kingdom of God, which is over all and eternal. Okay? The kingdom of heaven would only be in effect for a specific time. 
And we know what that time is because of the Old Testament prophecy. And the same sense is conveyed by the other occurrences when it is said to be at hand. So if it is at hand, it can't be over everything. Because it's it, at hand means it ain't started yet. Okay? So, Matthew 4, verse 17, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So when John preached it, it was not yet. It was around the corner. And when Jesus preached it, the same is true. It was at hand. It was not yet. It was around the corner. Then, when Jesus commissioned the twelve apostles for their itineraries, it still had not come because he told them in Matthew 10, 7, go preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's around the corner. It's coming. So it was still at hand then. It had not yet come into existence. It was still imminent. Now, it's very important to realize that this condition was still true at the end of Jesus' time on earth. For this subject even came up at his ascension. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, Jesus saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel. Well, if they're asking that, it ain't happened yet. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Hey guys, this is still the hope. Alright? So, the kingdom still had not come even at the end of his earthly ministry. So, that meaning of the phrase kingdom of heaven indeed is governed by Old Testament prophecies and it pertains to Israel. It's political. It's administrational. See, although Jesus announced it was coming throughout his ministry, heaven's kingdom never actually arrived. The king was indeed present. The king and his kingdom were proclaimed, but they were rejected. The Old Testament prophecies of the kingdom obviously had not come to pass. It will occur in the sixth administration and is recorded in the book of Revelation, chapter 19 and 20. This includes the Battle of Armageddon, the armies assembled, Revelation 16, the devil being bound, the resurrection of the just, and the reign of Christ, and the Jews functioning as priests. But that kingdom won't happen until the Messiah conquers the world. All this was yet unfulfilled when Jesus ascended into heaven and the king was no longer present. Accordingly, after Jesus was raised from among the dead, he no longer preached that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Instead, he spoke of the kingdom of God. The 40 days between his resurrection and ascension were a transition period Acts chapter 1, verse 3. It says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of heaven. Wow. At this point and throughout the book of Acts, the kingdom of God is preached. Well, the kingdom of God is overall. While the kingdom of heaven was only possible when the Messiah was upon earth. So I believe that's why the subject switched. 
in Acts chapter 8, verse 12, Philip was preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God to the Samaritans. All right? The scope of this kingdom had expanded to include the Samaritans and ultimately the Gentiles. When they appointed a day in Acts 28, Paul, there came to him many unto his lodging, Acts 28, verse 23, whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God. All right? And Acts 28, 31, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. All right? So now let's go back to Matthew and we're going to look at the occurrences of kingdom of God. Back in Matthew, the first occurrence of God's kingdom is Matthew 6, 10. All right, thy kingdom come. It's part of the Lord's prayer addressed to God. So, God, your kingdom come. Well, if they're praying for it to come, it ain't come yet. <laughs> right? That's so this is interesting because the greatest fulfillment of that is when God's kingdom, which is over all, manifests itself upon earth. So they, they were praying for it to come. That will fully come to pass at the restitution of all things in the seventh administration. Universe two is what I call that. But the implication is that this is still future. However, the implication in the next occurrence of kingdom of God is different because it is overall the kingdom of God has both present tense and future tense implications. The kingdom of God spans all time and is appropriate for believers of all eras to pray for it. Matthew six, thirty three. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, was that true at the time that Jesus instructed it? Yes. Is it still true of us now? Yes. So the kingdom of God is overall. You see how that fits? So, um, this implies that the things of the kingdom of God are available now. It constitutes a fundamental difference between the two phrases. Now, this is even more clear in the next occurrence. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. It says, when the Pharisees heard of it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But, verse 28, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. All right? So, when Jesus spoke of the kingdom of heaven, he said it was at hand. And it never came. It was ready to come. But the conditions for it did not come to pass. In Jesus' ministry, the priests and the scribes and the government, the Sanhedrin, rejected him. All right? So the kingdom of heaven did not come to pass. But here, he said the kingdom of God 
is come. You see the difference? Matthew 21, verse 28 through 32. What, what think ye? A certain man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I won't. But afterward he repented and he went. <laughs> and he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I will go. But then he didn't. Okay. Whither of those two did the will of his father? And they said the first one. Jesus said to them, Verily I say to you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and you, when you had seen it, repent, repented not afterwards, that you might believe him. So, here, the kingdom of God has a future idea to it. Isn't that interesting? The implication is that they would not gain entry into either kingdom, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Now, Matthew 21 is another occurrence. Matthew 21, verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard, hedged it round about, dug a wine press in it, built a tower, and led it out to husbandmen. Then he went to a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed the other and stoned another. And again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all he sent unto him his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, the vineyard comes, what will he do to those husbandmen? And they said to him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which will render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Well, the nuance here is very revealing because the kingdom of heaven will be when the Jews rule upon the earth. But if the kingdom is given to another nation of believers, it has to be the Gentiles. So this brings out another difference between the two kingdoms. See, so I think Bollinger correctly notes this difference in his eight points of comparison. The next one is Matthew 26, 29, Matthew 26, 29. But I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So that'll be in the future. So, there's one more, last one, Matthew 13, verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. So, he explains what that is. And in verse 40, And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, 
so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. So this is the Son of Man's kingdom in verse 41. And them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So the righteous shining forth in the, as the sun in the kingdom of their father, that is going to occur forever, while the kingdom of the sun is only going to be for a while. And that's why in verse 40, they send forth his angels and gather out of his kingdom the things that offend, and they'll be in the resurrection of the unjust, and that'll close that kingdom, and then the new heaven and earth will come after that, in which the righteous shall shine as the sun in the kingdom of their father. So, so far, we have seen there's a difference in how Matthew handles the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. I do not think that they are the same. However, there are people who insist that they are the same, and their argument is the opposite of what I've just presented, where they say that they have to be the same because Matthew uses phrases kingdom of heaven of the same incidents that are related in Mark and Luke and called the kingdom of God. Okay? Well, my position is that there are no other exact synonyms in the whole Bible. Every time there is something that's close, it still is relating a different nuance, like the names of God, etc., or the names of the adversary, or Jacob versus Israel. You see, um, they're emphasizing Jacob and Israel were the exact same person, but when Jacob is used, it emphasizes one thing, and when Israel is used, it emphasizes something else. Okay? Now, in these last few minutes of this teaching here, I have to depart from what I'm 100% sure of because there's not enough evidence that exists today to prove my point. But I have to at least state the problem because it's central to this issue of the kingdom. And I do not like what I am going to present. <laughs> I'm being honest with you. But it's the best I can figure. And so, if you don't like it, that's okay. I understand. <laughs> and also, if we learn something better, I would change it in a heartbeat. So, with that intro, uh, here we go. All right. So far... In tonight's presentation, I've presented both proven facts and my logical theories. The theories are the best I know that fit the state of the evidence which does exist. But now we're going to run into a problem no matter which way we go. And it deals with the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Matthew uses both phrases and we can clearly see that there is a difference between the two. In when Jesus was casting out spirits, he said, the kingdom of God has come. It's arrived. But the kingdom of heaven was announced as impending, but it never came. And we saw what kingdom they were anticipating from the Old Testament prophecy, and it obviously had not come. Matthew uses both those phrases and we can clearly see the difference between the two. But Mark and Luke only refer to the kingdom of God. And here's the problem. Like I said, Mark and Luke 
use the phrase kingdom of God in the same incidents that Matthew uses kingdom of heaven. So which one is it? If we conclude that the two phrases are equal, well, there's no other words like that in the Bible, we have contradictions without even introducing the orthodox theological conjectures that modern theologians have. The Old Testament states that the kingdom of God is forever. But Mark and Luke have citations which say the kingdom of God is at hand. Not yet, but impending. That's a contradiction. The Old Testament states that the kingdom of God is over the entire earth. But in Luke, it says the kingdom of God has to be won by the Messiah for Luke chapter 4 verse 5 and 6 says the devil currently is control, in control of the kingdoms of the world. So which position is the right one? Are they the same or not? Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to get one group or another mad at me no matter which way I go. <laughs> And, but there's not enough evidence to prove either one. So I have determined to take the option which fits with everything we have seen from the Old Testament. I mean, after that information, I, it's the only way we can go. One very important fact necessary to unravel this problem is that Matthew, the phrase kingdom of God, never occurs when Jesus began one of his parables. In Matthew, it is always, the kingdom of heaven is like unto. He never says, the kingdom of God is like unto. This fact is very important when we realize that all the gospel writers were dealing with Jesus' original words, which were spoken in Aramaic and they were translated into Greek later, probably not by the apostles who originally wrote. The styles of each Greek translator or writer were different. So the Greek translation of the four gospel is from different believers. Those four, the translator of Matthew understood the nuances of meaning between the two phrases but the other translators apparently did not. It also is very probable that the translator of Matthew was earlier than the rest of the gospel translators. Therefore, based on Matthew's translator's insight, it should be possible to correct the translations of Jesus' Aramaic words in Mark and Luke by editing in heaven instead of God. When Jesus used the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto when he opened up a parable. The Gospel of John only has the kingdom of God twice, and I believe they are correct. Now, this is going to get some people frustrated, but actually, I'm not changing what Jesus said. I'm not changing his original words. I am changing the translation into Greek of his words. All right? And to me, that's no different than selecting my preference from the different wordings in the modern translations or going into a lexicon and giving a more accurate translation into Greek. I mean, everybody does that. It's not changing the original. It's dealing with the Greek translations of Christ's original Semitic words. Because he did not speak Greek. Okay? So, there is a list of possible... Like I said, I'm not 100%. I don't like this. But it's the best I've got right now, all right? If I find a better way 
If somebody shows me a better way, I'll change in a heartbeat. Okay? But right now, it's the best I got because of that contradiction. So, there are a number of places in Mark and Luke where Jesus says, The kingdom of blank is likened unto, and he gives it in the form of a, par a parable. So, what I am saying is to fit those with Matthew because all the parables open up in Matthew with the kingdom of heaven right and Matthew's translator knew the difference because there's kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God that show up both in Matthew so what I'm saying in these list here that it should not read the kingdom of God it should read the kingdom of heaven so it would be Luke 7:28, where John the Baptist preached the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mark 1:14, Luke 16:16, 16, 16, Jesus began teaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then in the Sermon on the Mount, which uh, the comparison of that is in the Sermon on the Plain. In Luke 6.20, it should be kingdom of heaven. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Luke 13.28 and 29. The apostles in the 70 were sent. Luke 9.2, Luke 10.9 and 10. The parable of the sower. In Mark 4.1 and Luke 8.10. The parable of the mustard seed, Mark 4.30 and Luke 3.18. The parable of the leaven, Luke 13.21. Uh, we need to receive it as children, Mark 10, 14 and 15, Luke 18, 16 and 17. And then the rich man entering into the kingdom, Mark 10.23. Luke 18.24 uh, What is the sign of his coming? Luke 21.31 The parable of the talents Luke 19.11 And the parable of the harvest Mark 4.26 But all the parables there should be kingdom of heaven. Alright? That's the best I've got. Now, if we make the Gospel of Matthew a standard for the differences between these two phrases, then I advocate changing the occurrences of Kingdom of God back to Kingdom of Heaven for those in Mark and Luke, which are for the same incident. All right? There are four other instances of the phrase kingdom of God, which I'm not sure about in, in Mark and Luke, and I'm going to leave them as they are. And those are Luke 4.43, Luke 8.1, 9.11, and 14.8. All the rest of the occurrences of the phrase kingdom of God of Mark in Mark, Luke, and John make sense unchanged as being more universal or timeless, which is fitting that the kingdom of God is over all. So these unchanged ones well, Mark nine forty seven, Mark twelve thirty four, Mark fourteen twenty five, Mark fifteen forty three Luke 9, 60 and 61, Luke 11, 20, Luke 12, 31, Luke 17, 20, Luke 22, 16, Luke 23, 51, and John chapter 3, verse 3 and 5. Okay, let's look at John. John chapter 3, 
verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know who you are, that you are come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou dost, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So, when is this man going to be entering into the kingdom of God? Well, that's going to be in the future when the kingdom is available for him to do that. Okay? So this has a future component in it. Now, like I said, I don't like my solution. It's the best that I can think of. And if anyone has anything else they can propose that'll work, let me know. I mean, the kingdom of God is over all. But there's a possibility that it could have a past component a present component and a future component um, like in uh, thy kingdom come I want it now and then also we saw a few of them kingdom of God has a future connotation but then there is that one the kingdom of God is come to you that has a present tense connotation so possibly the solution is not what I proposed, but there is a past, present, and a future. I'm, I mean, it's still up in the air. But I wanted to honestly present this to you and let you know I don't like it, but it is the best I've got so far. This, my solution harmonizes Mark and Luke with Matthew, and it fits with the Old Testament. But like I said, it may not sit well with some. But regardless, there is a contradiction here which begs resolution. And this is my position because to me it makes the most sense. But please remember I'm not changing Jesus' Aramaic words, only the translation of them into Greek. And that translation was made by fallible men. If anyone has a better idea, please let me know. But for right now, it's this is my position. So, bless you.